today we're going to use some visible allegories to show you what's going on in the invisible world. You see, the invisible world cannot be understood without visible representations that show us what's going on in the invisible. Jesus used the real temple to describe to them the temple that his body was. And there are many, many other allegories that we're going to talk about. We're going to have to relearn the meanings of words and the meanings of phrases that we have had ingrained in us our whole life. In the next few weeks, as we're doing these teachings, I'm going to be using a lot of symbolisms for you to understand what's going on inside of you. And we're going to start out today with heaven and earth and take a deep, deep look within ourselves to the kingdom that I was talking about earlier. In each one of us, there is a heaven and an earth. I've used blue to represent heaven and green to represent earth. You see, the kingdom of heaven's within you. As I told you last week, Luke 17, 21, Jesus told us that the kingdom, that the heavenly sphere was within us. So therefore, if the heavenly sphere is the Holy Spirit of God that lives within us, the invisible spirit of God, then the earth is the tangible, visible flesh part of us. And what it is, the flesh is the only visibility that the spirit has. You see, flesh needs spirit as much as spirit needs flesh. They're both needed. Now, we're going to go through the scriptures, and we're going to use several different scriptures to see that God is talking about this theme all through the book. We'll start out with Genesis first chapter. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. Now the act of God speaking his word into the earth brought him into us. The act of heaven and earth colliding is the act of God's Spirit colliding with us. And that is what faith is. You see, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the spirit man, and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained an excellent report. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. Spirit and flesh are going to unite into Christ and become one new man. That's why Paul said, having broken down the middle wall of partition between us, making one new man, so making peace. He is the way, which is the flesh, the truth, which is his spirit, and the life, which is God revealing himself in us in the form of Christ. Now Christ is any flesh that has been anointed by spirit. That's why Paul said Christ is not one but many. You see, Jesus was simply the first flesh anointed to be spirit. He, like us, was flesh and blood until God appeared in him. That's why Emmanuel means God with us. So you see, heaven and earth are going to pass away. But his word in us will be the new way and the new heaven that he talks about in Revelations. Now, you can look all the way through the book and every single scripture is saying the same thing that flesh alone could not please God. We've had the idea in the past that flesh through striving to do what God's law had said would justify itself towards God. 
But God knew all along when he gave the law that there would be another day coming when flesh would no longer attempt to live up to his commandments. You see, he had already said that no flesh would be justified in his sight by living up to the law, by doing its commandments. And all men were counted unworthy and have fallen short of his glory. His glory is going to be revealed in us. That's why Paul said, it is not of our own sufficiency, but rather Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, what is the hope? It's the hope of God's glory being revealed in our flesh. That's why it says that Jesus led captivity captive and left a bunch of vanquished foes. In other words, flesh, which is dead to him, Jesus told the Pharisees, you're dead. Basically, his life within that death is what would resurrect them. Now, we have had an idea, as I talked earlier, about faith being something that flesh does towards God or spirit. But in actuality, faith is the gift of God, the Bible says. It is not anything anyone could have possibly done, but it is God's grace delivering faith into us that causes us to be righteous. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And he said all men are liars. And he said no liar has any inheritance in his kingdom. So we have misunderstood the word thinking that those who weren't going to get the kingdom were some men. That this guy over here would get the kingdom, but that person over there didn't qualify. You see, God was talking fractionally. He was not looking at the evil man and the good man as being Bill over there is good and Joe over there is not good. He was seeing within each person there being a righteous one and an unrighteous one. That's what he meant when he said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Jacob represents the spirit man and Esau represents the flesh man. Flesh will never atone to God's righteousness through any of its own doings. Now let me tell you a little story. I was watching a show the other day and it was on Kevlar vests. They were talking about how policemen were wearing these bulletproof vests that are very cumbersome and weighty and they, they're looking for something better that will be lightweight but yet still be bulletproof. Well, I was watching a show and the guy was talking about he brought out a piece of fabric and he brought out a piece of what looked like some clay or pottery looking stuff. And he took that fabric and he shot a bullet through it and the bullet went right through it. And then he took the clay and he dropped it on the floor and it just shattered into a million pieces. This was representative that spirit doesn't have any tangibility. It can't be touched. It can't be seen. And that flesh has no moral or substance or anything that's good within it. That's why Paul said, there's nothing good that is in my flesh. So basically, you need the combination of both spirit and flesh. They took the fabric and they took the clay looking stuff and they meshed them together with heat. And the fabric that came out of it was a new vest that was lightweight it was only a quarter inch thick and yet couldn't be penetrated by any bullet. This was to show that spirit without flesh 
is as useless as flesh without spirit. That you need both of them. Now that's what Jesus meant when he said, I came to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You see, the fire of God's Spirit is melding inside of us and melting us together with himself. The evil man of sin is within us and the righteous man of Christ is within us. That's why Paul said, put off the old man with his sinful ways and put on the new man who is renewed day by day. Our worst enemy is in our own household. We don't need to find sinful people out here anywhere when we have sin within ourselves. Now let's look at some of the parables that Jesus said. There was a man that built his house on the sand. And there was a man that built his house on the rock. Now a flood came. That flood is God's word flooding into our flesh. Now this man was dissolved. But this man was made strong because he was on the rock of the Christ. How about this one? In every house there are wood, hay, and stubble and precious stones and jewels. Now when they're all put into the fire, what's going to happen to the wood, hay, and stubble? Well, it's going to be burned up. And the precious stones are going to be made pure. So the two within us, the wood, hay, and stubble, the man that built his house on the sand, or the rich man, are our nature or our flesh carnal being. And the other side, the Lazarus nature, the man that built his house on the rock, are the Christ nature within us. God's not angry with men as individuals, and he's not going to burn up men, literally, but he's going to dissolve earth, or the fleshy part of us, as he brings the new spirit man into us. Both shall be made one, as it's written. He that justifies men and them that are justified are one. He also likens the two within us to male and female. That's what he meant when he said, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. This is a great mystery, Paul said, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. The church is simply the vessel that Christ inhabits. Now, heaven is my throne, says the Lord, and earth is my footstool. Who will build a house for me? You see, Christ, through entering into flesh, will build a habitation for God's Spirit. Now, what benefit does flesh have for spirit entering into it? Well, the Bible lists, long lists all through the book about the attributes of flesh. That it is evil, evil thoughts, evil surmisings, jealousy, envy, hatred, every kind of evil that can be thought of is within flesh. And there is no good in flesh at all. Then, what about the spirit man? What does it have? Well, it has love, joy, peace, kindness, righteousness, and any other good thing that can be thought of. Flesh needs the attributes that spirit brings. If flesh is all those evil things, then the melding together with spirit will give it the morals and characteristics of the spirit. So now what does spirit have to gain by entering into flesh? Well, obviously, spirit doesn't want the attributes of flesh, its ways and doings and thoughts. What it needs is flesh's tangibility. You see, spirit alone can't be seen. It needs to be in something where it can be seen. 
That's why you take fire and set it on a candle so that it can be seen and fill the whole house with light. Faith is, like I said, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The same way that we talked about man can't live by bread alone. Spirit being the bread or the life-giving invisible force of God and flesh being the visibility and reception and perfecting article of God. He uses flesh to mold spirit and to bring spirit into a certain shape. So God will render to every man according to his works. To him that's done unrighteousness and evil and hatred, he will receive that. To him that's done good and good works, he'll be rewarded good for what he's done. Now we know that's not talking about human beings as a whole because he says that no human being can be justified before me, that all have fallen short and sinned. God is looking fractionally in us. He sees different beings living within us. One side of us as being the flesh side, another side as being the spirit side. But both of them are under his control and doing a work that will cause there to be one new man within us. Now, flesh being the stone and spirit being the bread, when you take the grain and you grind it against the stone, it makes, after heat is applied to it, bread come forth and rise. So you see, you not only need the grain, but you need the stone to grind the grain against to form the bread. Bread cannot be formed without grain and stone. Man can't live by bread alone. The man who does evil works that will be rewarded evil is the man of sin or the unrighteous flesh side of us. And the man who does righteousness is the spirit side of us. And he will be rewarded righteousness. So then, as Moses said, anyone who does not listen to everything that this prophet says must be exterminated from among the people. Moses was talking about how one would come like unto him, speaking of the Christ, who would deliver the people of Israel. Well, what this was, was symbolic of what was going to happen in us. That spirit would enter into us and exterminate the unloving, uncaring, unkind side of us. God needed both. Now why would God want there to be iniquity and sin? Because he needed something to consume as he entered into us. The same way that fire needs wood. You see, as he entered into us and gave us a new being, he used our flesh side as a source of energy. He entered in, it says in Thessalonians, on the day he comes with flaming fire from heaven taking vengeance on all the enemies of God. Now we know that God's enemy is flesh. That flesh will never do what the law says but is contrary to God's will. So in entering in from heaven within us, God destroys the outer man of us and makes a new creature. That's why it said, Behold, the old is done away with, and the new has come. He makes all things new. So then, the sun is one glory, and the moon is another glory. And the celestial is one glory, and the terrestrial is one glory. And as we've borne the earthy image, so shall we bear the heavenly image. 
And as we have been reflective of his glory with the flesh, so shall we become his glory with the Spirit. For you see, there is no he is in him, but it is I am. There is no nay, nay, but in him everything is yes. We are going to take on his son and be manifest in him. Now, let's talk about faith some more. Jesus said, have faith in God. Now, we have understood up to this point that that means that spirit is asking flesh to have faith in God. But that's not what he's saying. You see, spirit is saying, have faith in God. It is not a requirement that is being required of flesh. It is a gift being given to flesh. The same way with the commandments. When he said thou shalt not murder, he wasn't saying to flesh thou shalt not murder as in accusing way, but he was seeing the day that he would come into flesh and was saying thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not do all these things that I've written. So basically, he justifies us by entering into us. And his commandments are fulfilled in us by Christ living in us. Because Christ is the end of the commandments. As Paul said, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in another place, no one will be ashamed who is found in him. Now what about all the scriptures that say, believe in him? That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Over and over again it says, if you believe in the Son of God, well, we've been looking at it as this God requiring flesh to believe towards Him, to have faith towards Him, to hope in Him, but that's not what it's saying. He's saying you will believe in Him. That in actuality, the only believing you have and the only will you have is when he lives in you to will and do his purpose in you. God will believe in you. And that's what he meant when he said, for whosoever believes in him will not perish. It's not talking allegorically about believing in him. It's talking about living in in his spirit and being enveloped in God's deity. So when this mortal has put on immortality and this visible has put on the invisible, then shall come to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. The body of this death that we live in is going to be transformed by the body of his immortal life surging through us. And everything that we aren't, which is everything that he is, is going to be dissolved into him. So you see, those who are going to be condemned are not people out here somewhere, but in actuality, a part of every one of us. A selfish, self-seeking nation, God talked about. And those who will be delivered is the seed within each one of us that God has planted in us to bring forth fruit. And as Jesus said, you do not bring forth fruit of yourselves but you must be connected to me. I am the vine, you're the branches. Without me, you have no life. So the life is in the blood that has flowed into us. And the transformation into the kingdom of his son is that our kingdom is filled with his. Now, 
He says, blessed are you that shall mourn, for you will be comforted. Blessed are you that weep now, for you will laugh. All these things are typifying God's appearing in us. And like I said before, heaven is coming from within us, through us to the world. I'd like to thank you for joining me this evening. And remember, we have the mind of Christ. Before I go, I'd like to tell you a short little story. And uh, it's a fable, but it's got a lot of truth to it. It's called Caterpillar Heaven. Once upon a time, there was a whole bunch of caterpillars. And they had a dream they dreamed of caterpillar heaven and they wondered and wished for the day that the big butterfly would come get them and take them there and years and years went by and their parents and their children all believed in caterpillar heaven but one day they came to a revelation that there wasn't any caterpillar heaven and that the big butterfly they were waiting on to come get them was actually them and what they were going to become. Think about it. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, I am nothing, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part is done away with. So abide now in these, faith, hope, and love.